Wild One J Baby, this is your girl J Babe back again with another video. First things first, I just want to wish every single member of the LGBTQ plus community in Nigeria and around the world a very happy pride. I hope that amidst the chaos ongoing in the world right now, you find peace and joy in the celebration of your existence. Now down to business. As you guys can already tell from the title, today's video is going to be about a few things that make being Nigerian hard in 2020. Now, those of you born and raised in Nigeria are probably going to be very conversant with the things that I'm going to speak about today. This video is mainly to inform the uninformed, which are mostly my international community that is not very aware of the struggles of the average Nigerian on a daily basis. Without further ado, let's get right into the video. Chapter 1, Gay and Effeminate Men Why put gay and effeminate men under the same umbrella? Well, if you live in Nigeria, you know that an effeminate man is seen as gay. That is why I'm going to be speaking about the two. Also, why just men? Research shows that an average Nigerian is more comfortable with the idea of female homosexuality. Therefore, more homosexu male, ho huh? male homosexuals are targeted more by civilians and the government as a whole. Now. Let me give you guys a bit of background information. On January 13th, 2014, our former president, Goodluck Jonathan, passed the same-sex uh, same -sex marriage prohibition bill. So it covers a lot of different things, but the ones that I want to speak about are that. This bill forbids cohabitation between same-sex partners or amorous display. There is a 10-year prison sentence on anyone who registers, operates, participates in gay clubs, societies, and organizations, or supports the activities of such organizations. Uh, if you're caught in the act, you can bug 14 years, right? This SSMPA, which is same-sex marriage prohibition act it criminalizes lesbian gay bisexual and transgender people the maximum punishment in the country that applies in the 12 northern states and 12 northern states are mostly muslim you will be killed by stoning for muslims that obey the sharia law now i did a bit of research reading into the criminal code penal codes of different parts of nigeria here's a few things that you need to know the first part of the section 405 but the penal code of the northern states says a male person who dresses or is attired in the fashion of a woman in a public space will be punished with one year of prison and a fine of a hundred thousand naira or both this law existing is now being used as a tool for the police officers and fellow citizens to legitimize human rights violations against the LGBT community here in Nigeria. In forms of jungle justice, extortion, even torture under custody, etc. Now, what you guys need to know is most times people are treated this way on the basis of suspicion. What does that mean? It means if you talk gay, if you look gay, if you walk gay, you will be perceived as gay and therefore treated according to how the law says you should be treated as a gay person. The SSMPA therefore overlooks any act of violence against this particular community in Nigeria. Let me explain if you don't understand. If you look up walk talk gay and somebody comes and stones you or somebody comes to beat you, you dare not go and report to a police officer that you somebody came to stone me because if the police officer should ask that person why they stone you the person will say because you look gay or you talk gay and you will be the one that ends up being arrested therefore this community is not protected in any way against violence from citizens or public officers. Fun fact, they have very limited access to healthcare. So once people know you're gay, they're not gonna pay attention to you in the hospital. This is just fact. Now let me read a few tweets from one of my followers on Twitter who happens to be a gay male living in Nigeria. He says, I was once bruised badly on my wrist by homophobes in broad day. People were around, but they never came to my rescue when the guys were doing things to me. According to them, I was acting girly and they didn't like it, 
so one slapped me and the other grabbed my wrist until I bled. Another incident was when I was coming back from the library with my friends at night. Some group of guys called me personally and threatened me but I didn't bother much because I was with my friends. On my way home, I felt stones dropping heavily on me. They stoned me and my friends that night. I got injured on my legs when I was trying to dodge the stones. I don't even want to talk about the thousands of slurs, threats, and rejection I face every day because I am what I didn't choose to be. My literature lecturer after exams called me in front of many other lecturers and asked if I was a she-male. She asked and laughed like a devil with other lecturers. I did not respond. Another one asked why I was walking as if I had a vagina. They all laughed again. They said I wasn't acting like a man. I was more like a confused person and it's not good at all for a young person. This is the testimony of just one of the hundreds of people who experience this on a daily basis. As you can see, it's something to be taken very seriously. The criminal code actually says that you cannot be arrested without a warrant in the section 215 and 217. Obviously, it's not going to be useful to anybody, but I just want you guys to know that the criminal code actually says you can't be arrested without a warrant. The message I'm trying to pass today is people need to stop using the law to justify their inhumanity towards members of the LGBT community in Nigeria. Look at your country. There is so many other things that deserve your attention and your energy in this country. This is the reality of the LGBT community living in Nigeria. Chapter 2 Women, a Rape and Death Crisis. Pull up the notebook. On the 27th of May 2020, Vera Uwaila, a 22 year old first year university student, was attacked, raped, brutalized with a fire extinguisher, and left to die. Uh, attacked, raped, brutalized with a fire extinguisher and left to die in a church. Of course, this made rounds on Twitter, national outrage, and people got the hashtag justice for Uwa trending. On the 10th of May, 2020, a video made rounds showing an 18 year old girl named Jennifer who had been gang raped after being drugged. Again, national outrage, Twitter got the hashtag justice for Jennifer trending. On the 2nd of June 2020, a 19-year-old named Barakat Bello was raped and stabbed to death in her own house. National outrage, hashtag justice for Barakat got trending. The suspect of Uwa's killing was apprehended. Jennifer's family wants to kill the case because they are not liking the attention that the rape of Jennifer has brought to the family even though the um, investigation is still ongoing and Barakat's case, uh, Buhari ordered an immediate investigation on her case. These hashtags and the outrage that um, Nigerians expressed on Twitter got the attention of national leaders, celebrities. Twitter made noise, yeah, everybody heard about it. So yes, Twitter got people's attention. But that doesn't change the fact that girls are dying. Girls are being scarred for life. Girls and women of all ages, shapes, and sizes are dying and being left traumatized for the rest of their life. How many more hashtags can we trend? How many more senators are we going to drag? How many more online protests? Or how many posters are we going to keep making to carry up on the streets just to stop people from raping and killing our girls and women. The honest truth is that women in this country are an endangered species. But you know what? It doesn't end there because rape culture goes hand in hand with victim blaming. More often than not, we hear things like, what was she doing there? What was she wearing? Why did she struggle? She wouldn't have gotten so injured if she hadn't struggled. What? You see, the painful reality of women and girls in Nigeria is that we might have sparked national outrage and gotten the attention of authorities, but it does not change the fact that the government is not protecting girls and women in this country. And it doesn't end there. Women are shamed, 
my fellow civilian. That is the reality of Nigerian women on a daily basis in this country. Right now, right here, some woman is being raped or being killed and it doesn't make it to the internet. The news doesn't hear about it, but it's happening and nothing is being done about it. Chapter three, the handicap of the youth fraud culture. There's news circulating that a certain celebrity, I'm not going to say their name because I'm going to do your research, um, was arrested during a joint operation of the FBI and Interpol in Dubai after conducting a $35 million fraud relating to ventilators used for COVID-19 patients. <clears throat> Let me just tell you guys what it's like for me, my personal experience. In an international setting, when people get to know that I am Nigerian, before we even start talking about Jolov or Davido, I can't count the amount of 419 jokes I would have heard in 10 minutes, and I'm not even exaggerating. Already, Nigeria is painted as the fraud capital. Now let me read you guys a tweet from someone on my Twitter timeline. It basically globalizes everything I'm trying to say here. This news has spoiled a lot for remote workers. Just read of a guy who got turned down by five clients because he's a Nigerian. Maybe that was why the Canadian company rejected me. They thought I was a scammer. Now I'm scared of applying again. It's a struggle. They have dented our image big time. Nigerians are no longer trusted to handle huge amounts. This thing is real. This is why many freelancers use VPNs to get the job they wouldn't get with the Nigerian nationality. Now you not only have to fight racism, you have to fight the stigma of being seen as a fraudster. And we have an act for this thing. We have an act, but our government doesn't do anything. Coupled with the fact that on a daily basis, young Nigerian boys are profiled by our police officers because of how they look, because of a certain hairstyle they're carrying, or even for owning an iPhone or walking with a laptop in their backpack. The ones that manage to stay at home and hustle from behind their computers are discriminated against because Nigeria is painted as the fraud capital. These are the things that I want to tell and inform you guys about certain communities or certain groups of people that are suffering the most from being born in this country. The gay community, the female gender, and young men hustling, trying to make money. If you didn't know, now you know. My job here is done. Thank you guys for watching this video. I hope I've been able to inform you on the difficulties of what it's like to be Nigerian in 2020. I hope I've been able to educate you guys. And I hope that now you'll be a little more sensitive to certain people that you see struggling if they belong to any of these categories that I've spoken about. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.